I'm Dr. Jeremy Stovall, Professor of Civil Culture at Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, and today what we're going to do is introduce you to our SFA Dendrology Lab, uh, which takes place over the course of 13 labs. Other than what we're going to go over here in this video, the entirety of lab will be out in the field uh, getting to learn about 150 to 155 species of trees that are found in the woods for the most part in East Texas. So we're going to do a lab quiz each week. So let's go over how these quizzes will work. Uh, we don't have any control over where the trees are that we're going to quiz you on. So it may be that you learn one or two new trees, then you have a quiz tree, then you learn a few more trees, then you have two or three more quiz trees. So it's all interspersed. You learn new trees and you get different quiz trees at different points. Ideally, and we'll be able to do this more and more later in the semester, ideally we'll try and knock all the quizzes out before we teach you new trees. We're going to learn about 15 new species each week. And I know most students like to get the quiz out of the way before you worry about getting even more information on new species. So um, now with these quiz trees, what we do is you'll be either with myself or a TA. We'll walk up to the tree and we'll point to the tree and we'll say, this is quiz number one. This is quiz number two, whichever one it happens to be. At that point, what you can do, you can climb the tree, you can break a twig off, you can pull leaves off, you can chew on it, you can whittle into the bark a little if you need to. You can really do anything you need to do to try and identify that tree. Um, hopefully you don't kill the tree for quizzing on big trees, that really shouldn't be a problem. Um, then once you figure out what you think that tree is, you walk away and you write down your answer on your quiz sheet. So a word here on academic dishonesty, um, you really need to focus on keeping your eyes on your own paper, keeping your own paper covered up, and not communicating or even looking like you're communicating with any of your classmates. The policy for the course is you lose a whole letter grade in the course if you're caught uh, committing some sort of academic dishonesty, so please just avoid it. We're going to get a whole lot of quiz trees over the course of the semester. You can miss a lot of quiz trees and still pass the class or even get an A in the class, uh, but if you cheat on a quiz, you end up losing a letter grade. You can't have any list of species out. You can't have any lab documents out even for the week that we're currently doing. Uh, because for example, this first week in lab, we're gonna learn several different oaks, I believe three different oaks. The family name is the Fagaceae, the genus is the Quercus genus. And so if you have out week two's notes, well, we're learning four more oaks in week two. So Fagaceae Quercus is written on there. So you can't have those out. So just a few things to keep in mind. Um, what we'll do then is whoever you're with that week, the TA or I, will grade your quiz right there on the fly. We'll mark a line through anything that's wrong. We'll circle anything that's misspelled. So you know immediately how you did on those quizzes. Once your quiz is graded, you go 100 or more feet away from anyone who's still working on the quiz. Um, just make sure you're standing out of eye line with them and there's no communication there. We'll keep an eye on that. And once everyone's done with the quiz, we get to then go over it. So if it was a red maple that you all just quizzed on and I saw that half the class put down Florida maple, that quiz tree is another opportunity to teach you the differences between red maple and Florida maple. So these quizzes aren't just to assess how well you've learned your trees, they're to help you learn your trees even better, which is the whole point of this lab. After this lab, you wanna be able to identify your trees. So here's how the quizzes will be graded. You can kind of think of them as broken into two parts. First is the common name, second is the scientific name. And so for most students, how you learn, you look at a tree and you try and figure out what the common name is. That's a sugarberry, that's a white oak. You work on common name usually. So you can see the common names right here in this box are worth six points each. Okay, so that's half the credit for the tree. Next you have the scientific name, that's the family genus and specific epithet. It's two points for each of those parts. So all three parts combined equal the same as the common name. Now with this, spelling counts for the family, the genus, and the specific epithet. Spelling does not count for the common name. Capitalization is a part of spelling, but I've given you a helpful hint here. See how the F in family is capitalized, the G in genus is capitalized, the S in specific epithet, and the E is lowercase. That's how you have to capitalize them. So it's right there in the header for you. So here's an example of a correctly spelled tree. So we walked up to red maple, you wrote down red maple, acer, 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 rubrum, that's correct, you get 12 points. So we'll write a 12 over here in the grade box for you, 
Um, I might write a C, just letter C, which stands for correct. That's the full 12 points there. Well, let's say you walked up to this red maple and you wrote down this, read Mupple. Well, that's close enough and there's nothing else we've te we're teaching this semester. We can confuse that with, so we'll give you credit for that. But then here, Acer AC had an extra E on the end. Acer was spelled correctly, but it was not capitalized. And you put rubra instead of rubrum. That's half credit for each of those. Even if there's multiple misspellings, it's still half credit. So that's a nine point tree. So if you're bad at spelling, you can misspell everything all semester, still earn a 75% in lab. Lab's only half your grade, so you can still pass the class. Okay, so let's say you walk up to it, you know it's a maple, but you can't remember if it's red maple or Florida maple, both of which we're learning here in week one. Well, you try to put maple and be like, eh, maybe they'll give me some points, sorry. You don't get any points. Uh, so if you're too general, you either don't get points. If we see that, we may give it back to you and say, you know, be more specific here. You can't just put oak, maple, pine. That's not going to work. You have to say which one. And then uh, here they left the box blank over here for specific epithet. In all my years of teaching Dendro, I've never seen a blank box earn any credit. So go ahead and write something down. Maybe you'll luck into a point or two. So this is a four-point tree. They got the family completely right. They got the genus right. No points for common name. No points for spe specific epithet. That's a four-point tree. Okay. Um, at some point your writing may become unrecognizable. Um, so over here, if you wrote something and we just can't even read it, I know I put maple there, but if it's just something you can't even read, uh, we can't give you points for that. Um, over here, family is just, at some point, misspelling becomes incorrect. So we, we decided we can't give you points for that. So um, I rarely see answers like that, but that would be an example of something we can't give you points for. Starting about week six, we're gonna start doing bonus trees and how the bonus tree works. You get one point for the common name, you get one point for the entire scientific name, provided all of this has either zero or only one misspelling. And that can't lower your grade at all, it can't hurt you. The only way a bonus tree can hurt you is if you cheat on it, because it's the same policy. You lose a letter grade in the course even if you just cheat on a two-point bonus tree. So please don't cheat on a bonus tree. We'll go over this again when we get to this in the last half of the lab. The first half of the class, we do a lot of bonus exercises in class. So we have bonus activities scattered throughout the semester. Now, when you look at this quiz, the other question is, how is this all graded? Our target is going to be 10 quiz trees per week. So if we give you 10 trees, there are 120 possible points. If you earn 90 of them, you got a 90 out of 120. That's what I used to calculate your lab grade. That's a 75% at that point. If it's raining real hard and we only get six quizzes in, um, you'll be graded out of six times 12. That quiz will be worth 72 possible points. Occasionally, students want more quizzes. If we do 12 quiz trees, that quiz is worth 144 points. Uh, it doesn't really matter how many quiz trees you do each week. I track them for the whole class. And by the end of the semester, invariably, everyone's within a quiz tree or two of each other. So it does end up being fair. So that's the lab quizzes. We'll do a practice quiz in week one so you can see how it works and so you can ask any questions that you might have on how these lab quizzes work. With the lab quizzes, we're going to start having a quiz in the second week of lab. We have a quiz every single week of lab, and the quizzes are always cumulative. Any tree you have learned in a previous week is fair game for that quiz. You're not quizzed on the trees in the same week that you learn them. That would be unfair. So if we teach you a river birch in week one and then try to give you a quiz on it 10 minutes later, you haven't had the chance to learn it. You haven't had the chance to study it. That's not fair. So the quizzes are always over previous weeks. We're gonna talk about this in lecture, but the whole way this lab is structured, the whole reason we're doing all of this is to help you build up pattern recognition and context for tree identification. We're doing that through repetition. So the goal here again, by the end of the semester is you look at a bald cypress, you look at a white oak and we ask you, what is this tree? Hopefully you give us the right answer. Not only that, not only can you correctly identify it, but we ask you, well, how'd you know that was a bald cypress? And without being a smart aleck, you'll be able to look at us and just say, hey, it looked like a bald cypress. Because you've seen enough of them, you recognize what a bald cypress looks like. So I've got Chuck Norris up here. Again, when you look at Chuck Norris, you know, you know that's Chuck Norris. When I ask you how, you don't say, oh, you know, the sideburn over here or his knuckles. You just look at them. You don't have to think about it too much. You know that's Chuck Norris. That's what we're trying to do with trees. We're trying to identify trees just by seeing them. And we're not going to fully accomplish this in the course of one semester. 
we're setting you up for success here this semester, but dendrology is something you're going to need to study throughout your life and throughout your career in order to learn how to identify these trees, retain that knowledge, uh, use that knowledge in your future career as a forester, a wildlife biologist, whatever major that you happen to go into. The other reason we're setting lab up this way where it's all in the field, you can't learn trees from a book. You can get great field guides. We've got some textbooks for the course that are good. You can get these great guides and you can read them and you can read that this leaf is opposite, simple, four to six inches long, pinnately lobed. You can read all this stuff, but you really have to see trees in the field to learn how to identify. So that's why we have lab structured this way. The other reason we have lab structured this way is you're gonna use all five of your senses. Sight is pretty obvious. Most of us look at the trees and that's how we make identification the majority of the time. But you wouldn't believe how many trees, leaves, twigs have unique smells where we're going to smell them and we're going to see what they smell like and that's going to be really, really helpful for us. There's a lot of different twigs and leaves you can chew on and they have a certain texture or a certain taste even and you can use that taste to help identify them. Uh, with bark and even with leaves and even with twigs, there's often textures you want to feel so you can feel that texture and see, is it sandpapery? Is it woolly? What's it feel like to me? Um, I have listing up there. There's even one tree that we're going to listen to. If you walk up to a basswood and you knock on it, it's going to sound hollow, even though that tree is probably sound, you know, wood all the way to the middle, not rotten or anything. So we're going to listen for a basswood. Okay, with dendrology, you know, there's a big difference between facts and opinions, right? Everyone's got an opinion. That doesn't mean it's correct. It doesn't mean it's a fact. Sometimes, in some cases in dendrology, low, your opinions matter more than facts do. So if I walk up and I crush a sassafras leaf and I say, this smells like Fruit Loops breakfast cereal, which it does to me. And then you walk up and you crush it and you smell it and you're like, that doesn't smell like that at all to me. Or maybe you've never smelled Fruit Loops. That's not helpful to you. But you smell it and you say, oh, this smells like citrus to me. That's fine. For smell and for taste especially, your opinion is going to be more important maybe than what we tell you uh, about these trees. So focus on that because again, the goal is to identify a sassafras in the future. You need to know what sassafras smells like to you. For other things, we have labs set up like this with small groups for a reason. It's so you can have the opportunity to ask lots of questions. So you may walk up to a tree, you may look at it, and you may say, I'm really noticing the yellow veins on the leaves on this tree. And so ask us about it, point it out, ask us about it. Uh, and usually the answers fall into a few different categories. It might be, yeah, that is a really good feature. I haven't gotten to it yet, or I forgot to mention that, but yeah, thank you. That's a great feature, use that. The other thing you sometimes find is, yes, that tree has yellow veins on the leaves, but you can go look at a dozen more of them and they usually don't have that. So this is just a weird tree. We've got a lot of natural variation out here. So that's not gonna be a helpful ID feature. The third thing that might result from that conversation is we look at it and we say, you're absolutely right. Those leaves have yellow veins, but so do 50 other species that we're learning. So it's true, but unfortunately it's not very helpful to know. So, uh, so if you see stuff, ask us about it. Uh, we'll go over it and we'll help you. Um, every now and then, usually once every other semester or so, I'll get a student that chews on every single leaf all semester from every species. And they'll tell me things, did you know Southern Magnolia tastes like raspberries? And I'll say, no, I've never tasted Southern Magnolia because that's a tree that's very easy just to look at it and identify. So I, I don't know what some of these leaves taste like because I felt no need to taste them. Uh, but, you know, write down what you think. It may be helpful. Okay, um, I'm recording this right now for a fall semester dendrology class. So this is really for you all, less so than in the spring. Uh, don't learn just the leaves. You won't have them by the end of the semester in most years. Now it's East Texas, uh, leaves hang on for a long time. Many of our species are what we call marchescent, meaning they hang on to some of their leaves, like the oaks, Florida maple as an example. And so you may have leaves on some of your species at the end, or you can find them on the ground right under the tree, but try and learn the form, the bark, the twigs, all the other stuff we're going over. In the fall, you have fruit on many of these trees that can be helpful, so focus on that. In the spring semester, you actually start by learning the buds and the twigs, and then by the end of the semester, uh, those students are looking at, you know, trees, and they may be moving the leaf out of the way to look at the twig again. So learn the twigs, that way you're good any time of year, because remember, your job as a forester, it, you're not going to quit when the leaves are off the trees and tell your boss, oh, I can't go work. If you're putting in FIA plots and you're working for Texas Forest Service doing that, 
you may be measuring plots leaf off, you need to be able to identify those trees leaf off. So whatever your job is, you're gonna need to work in the winter. Okay, this is starting to get repetitive, I know, but we have to keep in mind the whole point of the way lab is structured is so you can see a lot of these trees. Um, you can learn sugarberry from one tree, but you'd be a lot better off learning sugarberry from 10 trees. And that's an example of a tree that's very easy to learn. Some of these trees have a lot of variation. So this drawing is an example of red mulberry leaves. You can see on this end, they're showing them very deeply in size. They're heavily lobed. On this end, they have almost no lobing. You can find those different leaves all on the same tree on a red mulberry. Generally speaking, you'll find the heavily lobed leaves on juveniles, the less lobed leaves on mature trees, but you need to see a lot of different red mulberries to see the range of variability in leaf lobing. And that's just one example. So we're trying to show you a lot of different trees. Okay, so that's a little bit about identifying it. And the idea is you kind of try to identify it to common name because that's how most of us think. So then the other step of lab is you're gonna have to memorize these scientific names. Now, at first, this is a steep uphill battle for a lot of folks. It sounds like gibberish to a lot of us at first. It's based on Latin and a bunch of other languages. So if you're not familiar with uh, Romance languages like Spanish, French, Italian, it may be more difficult for you. Um, if you're a student that's fluent in a Romance language, this may be easier for you. Um, but as we go, you'll pick it up. Now, at, at the start of the semester, when we only have a few trees, the scientific names are a lot of work and they don't really pay off much. They don't really help you much. But once you know 150 trees, 200 trees, 300 trees, uh, you'd be surprised right now as a student starting in dendrology, you're actually more likely to start forgetting the common names and remembering the scientific names. So the scientific names are hard at first. They become more helpful the more taxa that you learn, and they really help us organize the taxa. They help us avoid a lot of confusion. Uh, so we've got species like possum haw and possum haw viburnum. Sounds like they should be similar, right? They both have possum haw in the name. One is a viburnum and one is in the holly family. They have nothing to do with one another. So common names can often confuse us. Black gum and sweet gum, they're both called gums. You would think they're related like black oak and white oak. No, they're not. They look, you know, nothing like one another really. Uh, black gum is a tupelo and sweet gum uh, is in a completely different family. So common names can throw us off sometimes. Scientific names help us understand what we're really talking. So it's a bunch of different languages. It's gonna be challenging to learn for many of you, but it does get easier. The nice thing is it's repetitive. We're learning maybe 155 tree species this semester, but we're only learning about 30 family names. It's repetitive. So on our first oak this week in week one, if you learn white oak, Fagaceae, Quercus, Alba, if you memorize Fagaceae and Quercus, the family and the genus, you know it for the other 19 oaks or the other 18 oaks that we're learning this semester, 19 in total. So learn it now because that's really going to pay off for the rest of the semester. Learn the meanings on some of these. Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. Southern Magnolia is going to be a great easy example that we're learning this week. Here you see the flower on it. Uh, Southern Magnolia is in the Magnoliaceae family, so that's easy. It's in the Magnolia genus, that's really easy. And then its specific epithet is Granda flora. Grand meaning big, flora meaning flower, and sure enough, it's got a big flower, like six inches in diameter. So that's going to be really helpful for you. You have to practice this a bunch, and how you practice these scientific names is gonna depend on your own learning style. And so for some folks, they'll just get out a sheet of paper and they'll write it down hundreds of times, dozens of times, whatever it takes for you. Some of us pick things up very quickly, some of us need more work, it just depends on you. Um, I've heard of students that have a commute to and from uh, the building or work each day, and they'll record themselves saying these names and they'll play it back and they'll listen to themselves saying it and that's how they learn it. That's one good thing you can use. Um, in lecture, I'm going to show you the SFA Dendrology website, and on that website, there's a number of different interactive quizzes where you can type in the names, and that'll help you learn it. So whatever works for you to learn these names, you need to do that. A lot of students will make their own flashcards. Great. Whatever you do, practice it over and over and over again. Repetition is going to be the key here. The other thing to keep in mind, a lot of this is based on Latin for the scientific names. It's a dead language. There's no true correct pronunciation, okay? Not really a spoken language anymore. But because a lot of these names are long and complex and convoluted, the best tip I can give you is to say them in a way that helps you spell them right, because that's gonna help you get a good grade, but also to break them up into choppy little short syllables. So this is the scientific name for pecan. I've just added in a bunch of hyphens, and it's Caria illinoensis. 
But when I went to type this into this slide earlier today, I did the same thing I always do to spell it right. I broke it down into these choppy little syllables. Car, ya, il, in, o, in, en, sis. Unless I say il, in, o, in, en, sis in that choppy little fashion, I always leave out one of these syllables right here. And so break it down into choppy little syllables. That'll help you say it right. That'll help you spell it right. And again, this semester, if you don't study, you're probably not going to pass dendrology. Uh, this is a difficult task we're undertaking. It's challenging. It's definitely manageable, but you have to study throughout the semester starting today. So whenever we have lab one, start studying after lab one. Start studying the next day. So you have to keep up with this class. You have to start early. And here's why. This is what the accumulation of species we're learning looks like over a typical semester. So a typical semester will be 15 or 16 weeks long. We might have a break in the middle for spring break, or there's often a break in the middle of the fall semester. You start at the beginning, and we're learning about 15 species a week. So look at this. So say this is a class, like many classes you've taken before that probably have two midterms and a final exam. So you've got a midterm week five, midterm week 10, final exam week 15. Okay, so let's say in many of those classes, you may not start studying until week four here. But look at that. If you wait to study until week four in Dendro, first off, you've probably failed or done very poorly on a quiz week two. You've failed or done poorly on a quiz week three. But now when you start studying, you're trying to learn 60 species at once. That's extremely difficult for almost anyone to do. And it's all but impossible if you're new to this, new to learning how to learn new species. And so don't wait till week four. Learn the 15 species in week one really well. That'll help you in week two. Then you get 15 more. I've got this paced out so it's manageable. But if you wait, you're going to be in trouble. It's going to be very difficult to do well. So start studying in week one. Study every week and study a lot. Okay, you probably need to be spending three, four, six, eight, ten hours a week on this. It's going to depend on how you learn, how your memory works. Some, some people can do it in three hours a week. Some people may need more, okay? Uh, an average might be at least six hours a week. The other thing you want to focus on is practice dendrology when you're walking. You go on a walk. You walk your dog. Look at trees around you. Try to identify them. You're driving down the road, even at 60 miles an hour, hopefully not driving, but you know, you're riding as a passenger in a car going 60 miles an hour. You'll be able to identify some of these trees even at that speed, especially in spring if they start flowering or in fall, depending on the fall color. So practice throughout the semester. It's really going to come in handy. Okay, uh, what I want to do now uh, is go over the different materials that you'll have available. And so for some of the labs, we'll have lab videos. I'm going to show you an example of that. Um, and then you're going to have three handouts that you're going to be able to print out and bring to lab yourself each week. The VT fact sheets, the easy ID sheet, and the pronunciation guide. And the goal on all these things is to minimize the amount of notes that you have to take so you can actually engage with the tree. These are all online already for the whole semester. They're going to stay online. The other advantage here is say we go out week three and we just get rained on. It pours on us. Your poor note sheets, they melt. They're destroyed. You can go back home. You can go back to the office, print them out, and you haven't lost them. So decide what you want to use. Print those and bring those yourself. Um, and so I won't be handing those out throughout the semester. Then after lab, you can review those same lab videos again. So let me change up my screen sharing here. Let me share a web browser with you uh, so that we can see how this works. Okay. Okay, so here I have the SFA Dendrology website. And so I pulled this up just by Googling SFA Dendro. And so what I want to do here is go to Dendrology, and it drops down here for me to Lab Documents. Uh, you may not see the drop-down menu if you hover on a Mac, but you can click Dendrology there. That'll bring you to this page where you can click Lab Documents. And so here are the 12 labs. Um, so you can see the different handouts. We're going to go over these handouts here in a little bit, um, but we can start with these handouts here. And so let me go to week eight, because this is one lab I have up right now here in August of 2020 that does have a video for it. So I'm going to click lab eight. And so it's identified as having the video. So uh, due to COVID, I, I filmed some of these labs. So this is about a 45 minute YouTube video that contains the, I believe this was 12 species here in week eight that we learned that week. 
And so that's going to be up for you. So if, you know, your attention was waning towards the end of lab and we got to our 12 species and you're like, I didn't remember anything he said about that one. You can click back later. You can go to the video. And if I, uh, here, I'm just going to go ahead and click that. And then I'm going to click, it's going to play you, you know, somewhere in that video. Let me pause it so we don't have to listen to me talk while you're listening to me talk. But if I go watch it on YouTube, there's a couple different helpful features in the way that this is set up here. Um, so one thing I'll be able to do now is I hover my mouse over the time bar here. You can see we're looking at kudzu right here, but you can see it's split up into little chapters. And what these chapters are showing you is what species it's talking about. And here's the other option. If you go down to the about feed in YouTube and click show more, here it lists all the species and what time they start at. So say you were like, ah, I didn't remember anything about summer grape. You can come down to summer grape at 3940, click it, and it's gonna take you right to summer grape. And I've got it muted now, but it's me talking about summer grape, telling you everything I'm probably gonna tell you out in lab about summer grape. So, so there you go. So you've got the lab videos up. Those are gonna be helpful for you. Um, hopefully I'll get them up soon for all the labs. We'll see how that goes. Next up, you've got the Easy ID handout. Let me open that up for you. And so when I look at the Easy ID handout, this is something I put together that my, is my idea of dendrology cliff notes. So as I look at this, you can see the family, genus, and specific epithet listed out here. There's the common name. So this is the common name we're using in class, but it's not necessarily the only acceptable common name. Uh, so for example, look at this species, Lagoniaceae gelsimium sempervirens, evening trumpet flower. This is a vine that also goes by the common, common name yellow jessamine. So if you know yellow jessamine, it's the same thing as evening trumpet flower. We will accept both of those as correct answers on quizzes. If you have any question about whether another common name is acceptable, just ask us. There's many examples where they are. Uh, silk tree and mimosa, those are both Albizia julie brisson. Uh, black tupelo black gum, those are both Nyssa sylvatica, same thing. Some common names we can't give you credit for. So for example, um, if I were to call something ironwood, that could be either Carpinus caroliniana or Astraea virginiana. I don't know which one you're talking about. And because I don't know which one you're talking about, I can't give you any points for it. So ask us so you know that that can't be used. And then the other thing, say, you know, you've always been calling it a certain tree something, but, you know, that name is only used in one little corner of Jasper County. If I've never heard of it, I, I can't give you credit for that. So if you have any questions on these common names, ask. Some others are acceptable, um, but, you know, you'll always get full credit for the ones listed here. Then you can see, this is already a lot of information, right? We're throwing a ton of information at you about these trees. We're not just gonna go over the morphology so you can identify it, but to our, our best ability, we're gonna go over what are the wildlife uses? What are the timber uses? How commonly is this used in urban forestry? Is it invasive? Is it exotic? We're gonna give you a ton of details on these trees so that it connects that tree to your major and shows you how it's relevant. What type of sites do you find it on? Is it shade tolerant? Does it grow in the un understory, overstory? You know, all those details, we're not quizzing you on that. Uh, that's just good information on the silvics that you're gonna need in later courses. You're gonna need that in forest ecology. You're gonna need that in silviculture. You're gonna need that in forest management. You're gonna need that in wildlife habitat management. It's gonna be important for your other courses. But as you're already seeing in week one, it's gonna be information overload. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by this, that's fine. We're giving you more information than you need right now. And so what this is intended to do is give you the three best facts on a species. So if you can remember only three things about a species because you're getting overloaded, I've tried to put these together to focus you on the best features that are most helpful to identify that tree. So that's the easy ID sheets. Uh, next up here, you see we've got the Virginia Tech fact sheets. And so we'll do a lecture here, lecture two, where we'll go over online resources for dendro. And I'll show you the Virginia Tech Dendrology website, which is a great dendro website, has a ton of really good resources. Google VT Dendro if you wanna go find it and explore it yourself. But I'm giving you a fact sheet that the folks there, John Seiler and others have put together on each of these species. So here's kudzu, we just saw the video on kudzu. Say, you know, we're teaching you this tree and we look at it and we say it's got alternate compound leaves, usually three leaflets. You don't have to be standing there furiously scribbling that down, taking notes, because look at this fact sheet that you have access to. Alternate compounds, six to eight inches long, three fuzzy leaflets. Individual leaflets, three to four inches long that's already written down for you. So you don't have to furiously take notes. If we tell you something offhand that's interesting about the species, you've got room down here to jot it down. 
But the whole intention of giving you this is you don't have to worry about furiously taking notes. So what you can do instead, when I say, this is kudzu, it has trifoliate leaves and the leaves are real, the leaflets are very fuzzy. Take a leaflet, pull it off the vine, grab it and feel it, feel how fuzzy it is. If I tell you a bud on something is pointy, poke it with your finger, feel how pointy it is. If I tell you something is rough or sandpapery or whatever, uh, or if we're talking about the smell or taste of something, get it, taste it, try it for yourself, okay? Because that's what's gonna help you learn these trees. That's the experience that's gonna help you start learning how to recognize these trees over and over and over again in the field. So you have these VT fact sheets here for all the species all semester. If you're going with the TA, usually they'll walk you in order on the VT fact sheets. If you're in a group with me that week, usually I'll go backwards from this or in random order just so I keep my group out of the way of the TA. The final thing you have is the phonetic, phonetic guide. A student asked me for this the first or second semester I was teaching Dendro. So I put them all together. I imagine most people don't use them, but it's there if you want. A lot of these came from something put together uh, by the Harvard University Herbaria. Um, and so uh, some of these I pulled right from them. They didn't have everything we needed in the South here. So I put some together, sort of my best guess is spelling. So again, it's there for you, but there's a few helpful quotes at the bottom. Uh, when someone presumes to correct your pronunciation, a knowing smile is an appropriate response. Again, Latin's a dead language. Um, some of the family names in the South, we would say A-C-E is the end all the family names. If you go to some schools up North, they'll use Italian Latin, pronounce it Pace. So it's a dead language. We're not going to worry about that. Uh, listen to others and practice what sounds good to your ear. Conviction is important. <laughs> so I hear people pronounce things all sorts of different ways. If you can spell it right on a quiz sheet, you're in good shape. That's what we're worried about. Okay, and so that was lab eight. I, I can click next here and here's lab nine, same thing. So you've got this for all the weeks this semester. Okay, I'm gonna navigate back to lab documents here. Oop, I accidentally went somewhere else. Let me go back to lab documents. Um, and here's the lab species list. This is something you can print out with all the species all semester. So two pages, all 155 species are on there. So that's available to you as well. Um, and then I'm gonna go over, I've got those PowerPoint slides we're doing right now. They're up here under lab intro lecture. You've got access to those. Um, and then I'm gonna go over these two diagrams on a few slides next. And so you can go print those out if you want as well. So, okay, let me go back to my PowerPoint here. Give me a brief moment to shift over. But that, those are the lab handouts for the whole semester. So, okay. So we should be looking at the PowerPoint again, hopefully. And let's continue to navigate through here. Okay, what I wanna talk about now is something we'll review in lecture uh, in, a, in a couple weeks. Uh, but what I wanna review is leaf complexity and leaf arrangement. And then I'm gonna show you why it's so important. So on many of our species this semester, they have simple leaves. So here is one leaf right here. Let me bring up my laser pointer feature for you so it may be a little easier to see. So this is one leaf right here. You have the petiole that connects it to this twig and right where the petiole joins the twig, there's a bud right there. Where every petiole joins every leaf, or sorry, where every petiole joins every twig all semester, there's gonna be a bud right there, bud right there. Then let's say you're looking at this leaf right down here. Okay, this is black walnut. This looks like a leaf, but you look to where it joins this spot right here, there's no bud. This entire thing is one pinnately compound leaf, okay? And so it looks like these leaflets are opposite. They are opposite, but these whole leaves may not be opposite on the tree. So not recognizing whether a leaf is simple or whether a leaf is compound throws students off a lot in figuring out later leaf arrangements. Um, this is just split up once. Here's a silk tree leaf, it's split up twice, so it's bipinnately compound. This entire thing is one leaf. And then again on this pepper vine, it's split up yet again. So this entire thing is one leaf. We'll go over that more in lecture. But the key thing to remember, and let me see if I can draw it out for you. You've got a twig. So there's my twig showing up in light red. I've got a leaf coming off my twig, just like this. Right here is a bud. Okay, so there's my bud. If you look and there's not a bud right there, you very likely have a compound leaf. And you're actually just looking at a leaflet and where that connects to the twig. That's the trick to keep in mind there. Here's another thing to think about. Well, how do I start thinking that a tree might be compound? 
Well, if a tree is compound, it's got this big leaf like this down here, that means it's got a big leaf, which means it needs a stout twig. So this twig is gonna be stouter, it's gonna be wider, thicker on a compound species. That's one thing to look for. Here's the other trick I wanna show you. Let me see if I can draw this. Okay, so I've got a compound leaf coming off this twig. So here's the petiole up to the point the first leaflet joins. There's some leaflets for you. I know my drawing's not the best. Uh, this experience would be very similar in the classroom with a dry erase board or chalkboard. I can't draw well in any format. Uh, but here's my nice compound leaf, okay? So I've drawn the compound leaf for you. When fall comes and my leaves start falling off the tree, let me see if this will work for you with the eraser tool. So that whole thing falls off on a simple leaf. But usually what happens with a compound leaf, the leaflets fall off. So those leaflets all fall off, and that leaves this petiole and rachis growing on the twig here still, stuck on the twig. Now I've drawn them as the same thickness, but the twig is generally gonna be a lot thicker than this rachis. Then this rachis falls off and it falls onto the ground, okay? And so you end up looking for two things as leaves are falling. You look for little slender twigs, usually curving, coming off stout twigs. The rachis and petiole are still up in the tree. Or you look on the ground, and if you look on the ground under a pecan after the leaves have fallen off, it looks like there's a whole bundle of little tiny twigs that are curved. Those are the rachises that have fallen off after the leaflets fell off. them. So you can identify leaf complexity even in winter, even when the leaves are not on the tree. So that is helpful to know. Okay, now let's get into leaf arrangement. We've got three options. World over here is only two species we're gonna learn all semester in lab. So almost everything is opposite or alternate. And I've drawn it out here for you, so it's hopefully pretty clear. This is a winged elm here, and the leaves alternate from one another. This is a red maple over here, and the leaves are opposite one another. They stick out on opposite sides of the twig. Those are really our two options. Now, this is gonna sound counterintuitive, it's actually easier to tell if a tree is opposite or alternate once the leaves have fallen off it. Uh, that doesn't sound like it would be easy to do, but here's how that works. Okay, so I've got a leaf there, so at the base of the leaf is a bud, as we see here on this red maple. Well, when that bud opens next year, it may grow into a new twig. So if the leaves are opposite, the buds are opposite. If the buds are opposite, the twigs are opposite. Now we have opposite twigs. What happens over time well, secondary growth occur occurs in these woody species. Those twigs become more stouter once they're not twigs, once they just become branches in future years. And so the whole chain of it, leaves are opposite, buds are opposite, twigs are opposite, branches are opposite. So all you do, say you've got a 100 foot tall tree and it doesn't have a branch on it till 50 feet in the air. You stand under it in winter, you look up and you start looking at the branching pattern on that tree. And if you start seeing a lot of locations where the branches are coming out opposite from one another, you can be pretty confident the tree is opposite. Now, this is forestry. We're out in the woods. You know, a squirrel will come up and eat this bud. Wind will break this off here. Branches break. Every opposite species is not going to be opposite everywhere. Stuff happens in the real world. And so just look for opposite repeated a bunch of times, and that's good enough. If it's alternate, you probably aren't gonna see much, if anything, in the way of it being opposite in most cases. So look for opposite or alternate. Now, let me show you why that's relevant. <coughs> and a quick word on opposite alternate. It sounds easy. It's harder to do in Dendro this semester. So you're already learning a bunch of new species for most of you. You're gonna have to memorize which of those species is opposite and which is alternate for that to help you. And you're gonna have to train yourself to look for opposite or alternate. I have students all the time mistaking ash trees and hickories. If you paid attention to opposite or alternate, you would never make that mistake because the ashes are opposite, the hickories are alternate. So some of our most common mistakes in dendro can be avoided simply by focusing on opposite alternate. So it looks like I just put a bunch of gibberish up on the screen for you, right? I wrote mad cat, big hippo. What the heck is that? That's nonsense, right? This is a silly little acronym but it's gonna help you remember what trees are opposite. Let me show you how it works. M is for maples, A is for ashes, and this signifies not just ashes, but the whole ash family. Ashes are found in the Oleaceae family, so ashes. D is for dogwoods. Cat big and hippo now are three different families using their Latin scientific names. So that's the Capropoliaceae family, the Bignoniaceae family, and the Hippocastinaceae family. 
Now, let me show you why this is so helpful. This is one of those handouts on the website. You can go print out. I have it up there as a PowerPoint file, so you can edit it however you want. I did this to help me try and organize all the trees that we're learning this semester. And so I use just the common names on here, but I put this together to try and help us split everything up. So again, the first thing you wanna look for is compound simple, opposite alternate. And let me show you why. Opposite, look down here. That's this corner in the bottom left, okay? And when I look at my opposite trees, let's go through Mad Cat Big Hippo. M is for maples, box elders a maple, and then we have Florida red and Japanese maple. They're covered. Ash family, A is for ash in Mad Cat Big Hippo. We have three ash species we're learning, white, green, and Carolina ash. And again, the ashes are in the Oleaceae, which is the olive family that covers our privets and fringe tree as well. Those are covered. D is for dogwood. We'll learn flowering dogwood right there. Now we have the Caprifoliaceae. That's elderberry, viburnums, rusty black haw, and a honeysuckle. So that's covered here in Caprifoliaceae. Mad Cap, big, big known yacy, big hippo. So big known yacy, that's, uh, sorry, that's going to be northern catalpa right here and a couple vines that are opposite. There are only opposite compound vines this semester, cross vine and trumpet creeper. And then hippo, hippo castanaceae is the, the buckeye. So if you remember mad cat big hippo of these 20 or so opposite species, it didn't help us with button bush, strawberry bush, St. John's wart and beautyberry, but it got the rest of them. <clears throat> and so that's really helpful. Look at this. If you can recognize that a tree is opposite and simple, sorry, opposite and compound, opposite and compound, we're learning 155 species all semester, but six of them are opposite and compound. That's almost multiple choice. If you can recognize it's not an ash or it is an ash, that leaves you only three species, your life just got a lot easier. If you can recognize it's opposite and simple, that's giving us about 15 species, still not too bad. When you're looking at vines, you can use the same trick and you can see how that breaks our vines down into easy to learn groups. We've barely even talked about our gymnosperms, our conifers. We're only learning eight this semester, half are pine. So if you recognize something as a gymnosperm, it gets pretty easy. We've got a few sort of understory, midstory species that are easy. Cacti, giant cane, our only grass, dwarf palmetto and yucca, which are our only other two monocots. So if you can recognize that it's an understory species, you're in good shape. If it is an alternate tree, it gets a little more difficult. Alternate compound, you've got about 25 species. Alternate simple, you're looking at what, 80, 100 species there. So you gotta start breaking it down to other features. But really work on opposite alternate, compound simple, and you can see why that's gonna be so very helpful to you this semester. Okay, this diagram is also available for you on the website. And what this shows you is how our very first lab is designed this semester. And what it's intended to do is show you the diversity of everything we're gonna see all this semester. So we're gonna have simple alternate, simple opposite, compound alternate, and compound opposite species, examples of each. Often we confuse angiosperm and gymnosperm with trees that we're calling either evergreens or broad leaves. It's more complicated than that. We're gonna learn a deciduous gymnosperm in week one, bald cypress. We're gonna learn an evergreen gymnosperm, lobolly pine. We're also gonna learn an evergreen broadleaf, an angiosperm, southern magnolia, and a deciduous one. Deciduous meaning the leaves fall off. We've got vines, shrubs, small trees, large trees. So we're looking at all these different habits, different growth forms. We've got bark of every color, okay? When a kid draws a bark what, on a tree, what do they do? Brown crayon every time, right? Brown crayon. We're going to see bark that's nothing like a brown colored bark. We're going to see bark of all different textures. Bark is a tricky feature. Bark is harder to learn than probably anything else we're doing this semester on most species. Some species are easy. Sugarberry river birch has very characteristic bark. Bark on oaks can be real hard to tell apart and other species like that. So pay a lot of attention to bark. The other thing to know with bark is it changes with tree size. But here's a cool trick. When you look at a big tree, you have bark, say this tree is two foot in diameter, okay? You look at where it's two foot in diameter, that's where what bark will look like on a tree that's two foot in diameter. But then, because you have a big tree, look up. Find where a big branch is a foot in diameter. That's about what bark will look like on a tree where diameter at rest height is only a foot. Look up even higher, find a branch that's six inches, two inch, one inch in diameter. That's what smaller trees or saplings will look like on the bark. 
Generally, bark gets rougher as the tree gets larger and older, and it's smoother when it's younger. So you can see all that on a big tree by looking at different branches of different diameters. That's a good trick. Okay, we're gonna see all sorts of different types of fruit. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of wing seeds in week one, uh, some eras. <clears throat> we're gonna see cones, which aren't even really a fruit on bald cypress and lobelai pine. We're gonna get legumes on silk tree, capsules, all sorts of different types of fruit. We're gonna see trees that grow on all sorts of different sites, from mesic sites meaning wet, to dry sites, to swamps. So a range of different site types. <clears throat> I want to draw up more attention though to these other two tables I haven't shown you yet. Let's talk about abundance. Ubiquitous means it's everywhere, okay? Uh, if you're in the U.S. South and you throw a pine cone, it's probably going to be a lavalli pine cone and it's probably going to hit another lavalli pine. They are everywhere, okay? We have some trees that are rare. Yellow poplar is real common in the southern Appalachians, but here in East Texas, it's not very common at all. We don't have very many of them hardly anywhere, so it's pretty rare. Well, which should you study more? You think, hey, maybe I'll study the rare trees because they're gonna trick me. They're gonna quiz me on the rare trees. Well, let's think about it this way. If you end up getting a job around here, which trees are you gonna see more in your career? You're gonna see a million more lavalli pine than some of our rare species like American snowbell. So really study the ubiquitous species more. You're more likely to see them in your career and you're more likely to be quizzed on them because you know, I, I could give you 15 lobelai pines as quiz trees probably every week all semester and not run out of trees, but you may never get quizzed on a snow bell or a silver bell or some of these rarer species that we're learning this semester just because they're not around. I don't have them there to quiz you on. So study the ubiquitous species more than the rare species in our area if you think you're going to wind up working in our area. And I've also structured the labs this way. I've tried to load the more common species at the beginning of the semester so that you can practice them all semester so that by the time you finish this course, you know the most common species the best because that's what's gonna help you the most. So focus on how common they are. The final thing I wanna draw your attention to on this slide is invasiveness. Many species are natives, okay? They've been here for thousands of years. We think they came in on their own. We don't think people moved them around too much, even though people may have been here for 40,000 plus years. Uh, Florida maple's an example of that. We have some species where in Nacogdoches County, I put NAC right there, yellow poplar may not technically be native. We may be outside its native range. They're not native, but they're not invasive, okay? They're not a weed, they're not a pest, which means you can see yellow poplars planted in people's yards on campus, but if you're just out in the middle of the woods, you're not gonna see a yellow poplar in Nacogdoches County for the most part. Then we have the invasive exotics. These are trees from elsewhere. Silk tree, for example, is from Iran originally. Um, and they're invasive, which means they can escape cultivation. You tend to find a lot of these in disturbed areas, roadsides, you know, those sort of places. So if it's an invasive, we're going to see a lot of them probably, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to see them uh, in disturbed areas a lot, but you can find them out in the woods. So pay attention whether it's native, I can find it out in the woods. Invasive, I can find it out in the woods, or maybe more of just a non-native ornamental where, hey, unless someone planted this tree, it's not going to be that tree out in the middle of the woods. Our first three labs are on campus. After that, we have a num number of labs out in the woods. So keep that in mind as we go. Okay, I believe we've got about two more slides here. Uh, so what I want to show you here um, is a simple tree, a, a key I put together that kind of works like a tree, a uh, decision tree, where you look next week in week two of lab, do I have a conifer or do I have a broadleaf? Well, I recognize this is a conifer. Does it have needles and fascicles, which is a clump of needles stuck together? Yes, it's a lobelai pine. We're only learning one pine in week one, so if you remember that for week two, you get it right on the quiz. Say you recognize that you've got a broadleaf and it's opposite and it's compound. Green ash is the only tree we're learning in week one that's both opposite and compound. So if that's all you recognize about it, you can get green ash correct on your week two quiz. So if you're having trouble with all these details, here's sort of a simple process you can go through. You can see this is pretty complicated with 15 species. It's gonna get increasingly complicated as we learn more species. It's probably not practical to do this past 30 species, but early on it, it can help you figure some things out. Okay, uh, the final thing I wanna leave you with is a process. So, you know, we all have that sort of brain fart moment sometimes, right? Where you're, you're doing a test, you're doing a quiz, and you're like, oh no, I have no idea what to do. So you walk up to a tree, you look at it, and nothing comes to mind, okay? 
this is what you do, the simple five-step process. Step one, is it poison ivy or poison sumac? Here's a picture of poison ivy, leaves of three, let it be, okay? We're learning poison ivy in week one. Poison ivy is very easy to identify. And the most important thing to know about poison ivy is that poison part. Uh, the whole plant, it's a vine, so the leaves, the stem, even the roots, the fruits, everything about it is covered by an oil called arushiol. And in most people, that oil causes a nasty reaction when it gets on your skin. The oil can spread on your skin. If you touch the poison ivy plant and then scratch your temple, you may have transferred the oil and you get a nasty rash right here. So it's the oil that gets you. Say you're really careful in the woods. You don't touch poison ivy all day, but you've been walking through it. And you go and you take your boot off at the end of the day, you touched your boot that had the oil on it, now you've got it, okay? Hot soapy water takes that oil off. So many people are susceptible to it, get a nasty rash. If you burn it and inhale the smoke or if you ingest it, it can cause serious medical issues. And for some people, they're very, very allergic to poison ivy and they may need cortisone shots or other medical treatment if they get anywhere near it. So if you're really susceptible to it, you know, know what it looks like, Stay away from it, manage where you are and how you interact with it. Poison sumac is much less common and it's on a rare type of site. We don't have to worry about that one nearly as much. Uh, it's found on our Bay Gall site type. So we'll go over that, but poison sumac's not a broad concern. It's rare and it's on a rare type of site. So I wouldn't worry too much about poison sumac. Poison ivy is everywhere. Here's the other thing you need to know about poison ivy. Poison ivy is fair game for our dendro quizzes. And so when the TA or I walks up to a tree or a vine or whatever, we'll say that's quiz number one and that's quiz number two. And if quiz number two is poison ivy, all we're going to say is that's quiz number two. We're not going to say that's quiz number two, but don't touch it. Um, I'm allergic to poison ivy. Some of the TAs are not. So some of the TAs are just used to touching it like anything else. So they may just say, they may grab a leaf and say that's number two. They're not trying to trick you. That's just how they're used to interacting with poison ivy. So then we're going to sit there and we're going to hope that you learned it well. We're going to hope you don't touch it, but this is going to be a learning experience. If we watch you pick up a poison ivy leaf and look at it and smell it and chew on it a little, we're going to be probably cringing, but we're not going to tell you to stop. Okay. We're teaching it to you in week one. It's easy to identify. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but usually after that quiz, I'll say right after that quiz is over, Number three was poison ivy, and I usually keep an eye on the class, and you, you, and you touched it, and, you know, here's some hand sanitizer, there's a creek over there, go rinse your hands off, you know, that sort of thing, but, so don't touch poison ivy, we don't want get anyone getting a rash or anything like that, but it is fair game for quizzes, be aware of that. Next up, think about that big diagram we looked at is a conifer, a broadleaf or vine, only eight conifers all semester, only about 15, 20 vines all semester, lots of broadleaves, right, so that helps you break it down. Then we talked about opposite or alternate. We talked about compounds, simple. Look for those things. Train yourself to look for those things. They're hard to look for, but we saw why those are important. And then finally, what else do you notice? Sugarberry has warty bark. If you notice warty bark, you're done, easy. Um, if you know the fruit on a maple, they're pretty distinct Samaras. You look at that, you've got it, it's easy. Persimmon is a difficult tree for many people to identify, but a big one has very distinct bark. And if they have fruit on them, it looks like a small orange tomato that makes them very easy to identify. So look for those gimme features that you might notice and look all over these quiz trees. I can't tell you how many times I've had students miss persimmon, then we get back at the end of the quiz and we're going over it and I ask the class, how did you know that was a persimmon? And the student who got it right pointed up is like, there's fruits in the top. And other people were in a hurry and didn't look at that. So pay attention to these, but that's the process that you go through. So those are all the slides that I have to share with you to introduce you to the lab. The rest of our lab, as I mentioned, will be in the field. Uh, but really, keep in mind why we're doing this. We're doing this so you can learn in the field how to identify trees. And we're doing that because you need to do that for almost everything else we do in forestry, wildlife, uh, geospatial science, whatever your major may happen to be. You're going to need these skills throughout your career. And so this semester is a start to you being able to identify trees in the field, but it's going to take a whole lifetime of practice uh, to continue to hone these skills. So we're getting you off to a good start. We're giving you all the tools you need to learn yourself. And you can see it's a lot of tools. Um, if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's fine. The important message is keep working at it. Uh, you will get better. It's going to be a challenge, uh, but it's a challenge you all are up to. So um, I'll see you uh, in the field, hopefully, uh, for lab here shortly.